Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art. And I'm going to continue reading um, our little thing called, you know, the, the Safety of Nuclear Power by Alvin M. Weinberg, the nuclear apologist who uh, basically convinced a lot of people that the nuclear industry knew what they were doing, that they would protect the world, and that we had nothing to worry about and everything was just fine, perfectly fine. Well, things are not fine as we all know. And one of the things I want to let you know is that um, when I'm up, finished with summer school in about a week and a half, I'm going to create a petition that I will post at the bottom of my videos uh, subsequent to writing it. And I hope that people will download it. I am going to create a petition and I'm going to canvas the streets, the neighborhoods of Eugene trying to get 100 signatures. And I'm going to format it exactly according to the NRC petition. And hopefully we can, I want to get, this is my goal, to get 100 signatures from people in Eugene to stop this idea of hormesis. Uh, we really need to bombard the NRC with, they can't fucking get away with it. Uh, they can't just pretend like radiation does not harm every single thing it touches. So, I'm going to continue reading. We are on page 10. And uh, we're at the new subtitle called Chemical Processing and Transport. I'll take off my glasses so I can read better. Uh, and this is Dr. Alvin M. Weinberg saying this to a group of scientists. Uh, well, let me read the last sentence. Okay, I beg your pardon. Uh, it says, to summarize, I cannot say that a serious reactor accident is impossible and will never happen. No shit, Sherlock. However... I can say that the probability of this ever happening is extremely small. And further, no matter how small the probability, the reactor community is exerting itself to ferret out and correct possible weaknesses that could lead to trouble. Really? Like not having your generators above where you might think a tsunami would happen? The new subtitle is called Chemical Processing and Transport. I lump these together because if reactors and chemical plants needed for reprocessing their fuel were built very close to each other, as in nuclear parks, the transport problem as a separate safety hazard would largely disappear. Well, they never fucking did that, did they? I therefore have espoused such parks, for example, in my testimony before the Senate Interior and Insular Affairs Committee in October 1971. Though I realize there are contrary arguments militating against them. Vulnerability to enemy attack and the local concentration of waste heat, to mention a few. As for the chemical fuel reprocessing plants themselves, we at Oak Ridge National Laboratory are studying measures that might be taken to reduce radioactive emissions from such plants as low as those from light water reactors. Around 5% of radiation levels from natural sources at the plant boundaries. This motherfucker keeps talking about natural sources. God dang, it makes me mad. We believe these plants with practicality, I'm sorry, we believe these plants with practically zero release are actually quite feasible and would probably add around 0.5 millisieverts per kilowatts to the cost of nuclear power. But our present technology and philosophy of citing separates the chemical plants from the reactors. I'm going to read that again. But our present technology and philosophy of citing separates the chemical plants from reactors. And so we are confronted with the necessity of transporting heavy radioactive materials. To estimate the hazard let us suppose that by the year 2000, we have a million kilowatts of nuclear power, of which two-thirds are liquid metal fast breeders. There will then be 7,000 to 12,000 annual shipments of spent fuel from reactors to chemical plants, with an average of 60 to 100 loaded casts in each transit at all times. Projected shipments might contain 1.5 tons of core fuel, which has decayed for as little as 30 days, in which case each shipment 
while in transit would generate 30 kilowatts of heat. Heat, not radioactivity. You like the way he says that, heat. And 70 million curies of radioactivity. 75 million curies of radioactivity. Present casts from light water reactors might contain material that produce 30 kilowatts of heat and contain 7 million curies of radioactivity. I, I think that they actually intentionally write, make these sentences and say these words in the way that they do so that our eyes just start fucking rolling in the back of our heads. <clears throat> Present casts from light water reactors might contain material that produce 30 kilowatts of heat and contain 7 million curies of radioactivity. 7 million. Wow. Design of a completely reliable shipping cask for such a radioactive load is a formidable job. At Oak Ridge, our engineers have a design that looks very promising. As now conceived, the heat would be dissipated by transferring it to the surrounding air by use of liquid metal or molten salt. And the cask would be provided with rugged shields that would represent that would resist deformation that might caught might be caused by a train wreck. Oh my god. The shipping cast will be designed to withstand a 30 minute fire and a drop of 30 feet onto an unyielding surface. Well, they didn't plan for the fucking tsunami, did they? <sighs> Can we estimate the hazard associated with transit of these materials? In rail transport in the United States, a derailment occurs once per million car miles. Thus, if there were 12,000 shipments per year, each of a distance of 1,000 miles, we would expect 12 derailments annually. He's talking of radioactivity, 12 derailments. However, the number of serious accidents would be perhaps 1 million to 10,000 fold less frequent. And the shipping casts are designed to withstand all but the most serious accidents. The train wreck near an oil refinery that goes into, re into flames as a result of the crash. Thus the statistics, a serious accident every 1,000 to 100 years, at least until the year 2000. These people fucking, literally, it's unconscionable that he even wrote these fucking words. The statistics, the statistics, a serious accident every thousand to one hundred years, at least until the year 2000, looks quite good. So we had Chernobyl, we had Three Mile Island, and we've had Fukushima. And that's not counting all the other fucking, like, major near catastrophes or leaks that they haven't even fucking told us about. Nevertheless, the shipping problem is a difficult one and may force a change in basic strategy. For example, we may decide to cool, cool fuel from LMFBRs in a place for 360 days before shipping. This would reduce the heat load sixfold and increase the cost of power by only 0.2 millisieverts per kilowatt hour. The solution that I personally prefer is to cluster the fast breeders in a nuclear power parks, which have on their own which have on their own on-site reprocessing facilities, and thus eliminate the transport question. Oh my God, he must have thought he was so brilliant for that. New subtitle, Waste Disposal, which they're still fucking grappling with, right? The waste from nuclear reactors will remain radioactive for an extremely long time. Plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,400 years, and waste containing this nuclide will remain potentially dangerous for 200,000 years. Let me repeat that. Plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,400 years, and waste containing this nuclide will remain potentially dangerous for 200,000 years. 
When one speaks of long-term reliability of nuclear systems, then in the broadest sense, one must be prepared to address the question of coping with such waste responsibly for items longer than mankind has ever had to conceive of his works affecting. Thus, two fundamentally different philosophies had developed with respect to dealing with these wastes. The most obvious is to store them as rock-like solids in concrete vaults above ground. This is one of the systems the AEC has under serious considerations, at least for the present. Now vault storage is perfectly feasible and extremely safe, certainly at least as safe as the reactors themselves. However, if one thinks about it for a minute, the prolonged storage in vaults of waste containing plutonium-239 require a long-term commitment to a highly intelligent, to highly intel, I am going to repeat that again, I apologize. The prolonged storage in vaults of waste containing plutonium-239 requires a long-term commitment by highly intelligent managers of such waste systems. Highly intelligent. Oh my God, we're so lucky. They're so fucking smart. Thus, the price exacted by permanent disposal. Sorry. Thus, the price exacted by permanent disposal of waste in concrete vaults may be a commitment. Listen to this. Wow, this is the first time he uses this, too. This is why I decided to read it. Thus, the price exacted by permanent disposal of waste and concrete vaults may well be a commitment to a priesthood that will tend the vaults for times unimaginably longer than the time scale of any previous human endeavor. A priesthood, these mother arrogant fuckers. It is for this reason that the Atomic Energy Commission views concrete vault storage as temporary, say for 50 to 100 years, and has actively pursued the second approach, that of disposal in underground geologic formations. We did that. We have filled the salt domes in the bayous with radioactive waste. The great advantage of underground disposal in naturally occurring geological formations is that in principle, the waste could be sequestered there for, forever out of contact with the biosphere. And moreover, no human, mo human monitoring would be required once the wastes were in place. Bedded salt comes very close to being the ideal geological formation as the National Academy of Sciences recommended in 1955. For example, the Kansas salt deposits have been undisturbed for 200 million years. Did you hear that? The Kansas salt deposits have been undisturbed for 200 million years. Their continued presence means that they have not been in contact with circulating groundwater, for otherwise the beds would have dissolved. And indeed, the salt beds are in every respect except one without fault. The only clear weakness of salt for radioactive waste disposal is that one must guarantee that man does not intervene with digging holes for oil, for example. Holes in the salt might allow water to enter the mine, and the integrity of the salt deposit could not then be guaranteed. Thus, even disposal into geologic formations such as salt may require some human surveillance, almost into perpetuity. Wow. The great advantage of such, such schemes, however, is that the degree of surveillance amounting merely to preventing people from digging holes is much less than is required for disposal of above ground faults. I'm going to stop here on page 14 and we are at the conclusion. So uh, let's see, this is Thursday night, 
I'll be on my radio show tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I will be taking in call-ins. Um, I don't think I'll be able to read again until Monday or maybe Tuesday. We're going to the Crater Lake with my science class. And the homework assignment is due on Tuesday. I have a homework assignment due on Monday and one due on Tuesday. And I have a pile of work at work. So I don't think I'll get to this conclusion until Wednesday. If I can squeeze in some time, I'll definitely do it. But I'm just going to warn you that uh, I'm super pressed for time right now. But I didn't want to go too long without finishing this reading. And I really appreciate everybody's support. You know, it's going to, you know, it's going to take a village. It's going to take us as humans. And whoever is listening to this, we all need to get our courage feet on. We all need to decide that we're going to do something. That's why I decided I'm not just going to write a letter from me. I am going to write a letter from me to the NRC about the hormesis issue. But I'm going to create a petition that I will create a PDF you guys can download. And I would encourage anybody who can to go and canvas your own area with this petition or create your own. But I'm definitely going to be posting one because we really need, I mean, I think we could stop this hormesis plan if we even had 200 people protesting. Um, the NRC is nothing but a bunch of cowards, and they're lazy, and they want people to like them. So that's why they lie, because they want people to like them. You know, the reason people lie is so that we will approve of them. So, um, you know, it's hard to live your life and be authentic in our culture because we live in a culture that demeans people just for being themselves. They have to have some money. They have to have some edification through an education or something. You know, it's like, well, who the hell are you? Well, I encourage every single person who listens to these videos to understand that every single human being is valuable. And especially in this fight, we are all important. And the pressure that we put on the NRC is real. And they hear it. And they will respond. So I'll end here. I'm at 17 minutes. Ciao, you guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'm going to have a call in on my radio show. Um, and I'll be doing that, I think, every single Friday. I'm on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mondays, I think I'm just going to do the news and rants. And then on Wednesdays, I'll be doing interviews. And on Fridays, I'm hoping to have people call in. I'll be talking about things, but I hope that people will call in and we can have a really sound discussion. So let's move this ball down the field. Uh, let's keep supporting the anti-nuke activists who are actually out there doing the work. Let's share in their energy and let's keep moving forward, you guys. Ciao. Put your courage feet on and let's start walking. Bye-bye.